This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 97 of the Dressage Radio Show, brought to you with the generous support of Kentucky Performance Products, Equisketch, and Equestrian Collections. I'm Chris Stafford, and my guests this week are Maria and Ferdy Alberg. Welcome, both of you, to the show. Hi. Hello. Nice to have you both on. We should uh, give a little bit of background as to where you are for our listeners around the world. I think you're in a particularly nice part of England. Ferdy, just uh, tell us a little bit about the stables you have there, because you've been there quite a while and built that up from scratch, haven't you? Yes. <clears throat> we moved here at the uh, eighty four. Uh, and the farm, the you know, little farm, uh, had nothing for horses at all, and we needed to get building right from the scratch. Um, it's uh, now a very nice unit with um, about 25 stables and uh, an indoor arena, outdoor arena. We've got a little sun track around the field at the front, which we use quite a lot uh, to get the horses off the uh, off the dressage arenas, and uh, especially the young horses, it does them a lot of good. And um, so, you know, we're... We're quite um, nicely contained with that. We we work, obviously, uh, I work with the two uh, kids of Michael and Maria with the horses. I've got another son, Luke, that uh, jumped the ponies till he was 16, but then didn't make the jump to the horses, and he's now mostly interested in football and uh, he's uh, studied sports technology in um, in the uni, so uh, I hope he will... He will keep in the sport uh, for some, you know, for some reason or another, but uh, he's not with horses himself. Well, it must be a dream of every parent who's passionate about a sport, Ferdy, to have the children, such as Maria and and Michael, of course, so good at it. Not just interested, but so successful at it. You must be enormously proud of of them following in your footsteps. Yes, I mean that's obviously very nice when you build something up that you. Uh, you can pass it on and, and make more of it uh, with other family members being interested in the same. And uh, Maria, of course, followed right through from the from the pony club. Uh, so did Michael, in fact, but his sort of direction was the jumping. And till sort of two and a half years ago, he he was quite um, intensive show jumping. Um, so we uh, we now sort of coordinated this a little bit and got him interested in the dressage just the same. And uh, it is, you know, it's very, very nice reward when we can feed back uh, to each other, you know, from all three um, uh, uh, directions there. And, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's a lot of fun. Well, Maria, as your dad says, you have had a very distinguished career already and you're still only 26 and already you made the teams many times. Is this something that you always remember you were passionate about that you always wanted to follow in your dad's footsteps? Uh, well, I, I remember as a kid definitely going to all the shows with dad, uh, which was great. I'd always be uh, hand-walking dogs and <laughs> taking them around so I could <laughs> watch everything that was going on. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think I, I had um, a bit of variety sort of with the pony club. I did a bit of everything. And then actually I was probably a little bit more into the eventing with the ponies. Um, but then my pony had various leg injuries from past events, so I couldn't really pursue that with him. Um, so ended up concentrating more on the dressage with him. And then it sort of led on from there, really, sort of got into it. And then uh, my junior horse was uh, more for the dressage, and, and so it carried on. But, I mean, having, having had that from a young age with all the experience that Dad's got was just absolutely brilliant. Well, Ferdy, of course, having three children that have an interest in it, as a parent, well, were you one of these parents that said, OK, the horses are there if you want to play with them? Or were you an encouraging parent? Did you really want them to become successful horsemen and women? Well, I obviously, sort of, I would have welcomed it. But uh, I have to say I wasn't, um, I wasn't pushing uh, at, at the early stage at all because... I've seen from my experience a little bit in Germany, I've seen quite a few times when uh, children have everything available for them. Uh, and in fact, it is so 
put in front of them that actually they lose interest. Um, and so I, I was a little bit consciously aware that I, I didn't want to push for it too early. And I have to say I left quite a bit to my wife, Jerry, um, to take the kids uh, to the pony club and let them just enjoy themselves and have fun. And uh, then it sort of, you know, it started from there. I was obviously still busy myself with the competing and the training. And um, I remember catching Maria once at a very early age, trying to teach um, the Shetland uh, the Piaf in hand <laughs> uh, and, and trying to copy me there. And uh, I remember Michael once coming to me and saying, you know, well, do I really have to book a lesson to actually get some help from you? <laughs> um, so, you know, that sort of, I, I really let them come and find their interest from themselves. And uh, then, of course, I was there to support them in every way. I remember um, I was always, always fascinated when Dad would help um, a few clients who had ponies and things. I remember J.D. Lister coming up and seeing a pony cross its leg and do half passes. I was, I was absolutely stunned by that. I think that probably gave me a spur <laughs> to do it. So when, when you were watching all this going on as you were a young person, Maria, did you, I mean, because so, some children would say okay well I don't really want to learn from my parents I want to go somewhere else and I'm going to be more receptive to learning from somewhere someone else was that that was clearly not the case for you because you have such respect for your dad's knowledge and and skills and experience in dressage yeah no I mean um really I've I've had everything sorted out at home you know if ever I've had a problem dad's been right on top of it so I've never felt the need to go anywhere else I mean obviously it's it's great to have little input from different people here and there because they don't see you all the time. You know, sometimes if you're always sort of being seen by the same person, they get to know you so well. But um, really, I've had er all the help I need here and, and everything sort of done. I didn't need to go anywhere else. <laughs> so, Ferdy, when you were watching your children grow up, and, and Maria in particular obviously has become extremely successful making it onto the British team now um, on several occasions... When you were watching that talent unfold, at what point did you think, gosh, she really has got it. She's going to make it to, you know, to the top of the sport. Well, she's, she's always been very, uh, very dedicated to um, whatever she's done with, with any of the ponies or the horses or, you know, and she has a she has a very good way of feeling herself into a horse. So, you know, something that is a bit sort of sensitive and takes a little bit of um, uh, special dealing with she's. She's always been able to uh, to show a lot of um, uh, tact and and you know the adjustment that is needed to uh, to make the horse want to com want to um, work for you. Uh, she's always been very good at that. I I um, you know myself I've you know I've probably at times people will say I'm a little bit too particular about things, but um, I think the the the, the detail. And the you know the consistent discipline in looking after that kind of thing in in training uh, has always been a very sort of important and strong point with me. And obviously that rubs off on onto the others that are around me quite uh, quite easily and quite strongly. So I think they've you know both now Michael already even when he was show jumping he was working his horses on the flat, his jumping horses in a very similar way than we are working. Uh, our young horses and dressage horses. So the, the the whole approach to the to the right sort of flat work and the clarity in in the horse's understanding, the importance of you know suppleness and and athleticism um, is is always been very very clear here. Well, Ma Maria, clearly with your dad being German, there was always that work ethic and the discipline. Did you feel that that was instilled in you in an early age and that you were quite happy to perpetuate that as, as your model and, and in the way you developed your own horsewomanship? Yes, I mean, I think, um, you know, obviously the way you're brought up, that's what you get used to. But um, I think I myself am quite particular as well, so I'm very happy with it. <laughs> And I actually, I get a little bit worried if dad's very quiet and doesn't pick me up on things. <laughs> I'm a little bit sort of like, what's wrong? Um, and I think if, if you want to be good at anything, you have to be very particular, especially when it gets to the higher levels. Um, so I think, I think I'm, I'm very happy with that. I like being a perfectionist. <laughs> well, let's talk about the horses, Ferdy, that you have. And you so generously uh, allow your daughter to ride and make the team. You know, there's no shortage of good horsepower in the Alberg stables. 
Well, it, it's you know, it's you have to have you know, with horses, you have to have a little bit of good, good fortune. Uh, we're, we're in a in a very uh, lucky position at the moment. We've got, you know, obviously Maria's horse two socks. I bought as a three-year-old, um, and he's been here ever since. So to have you know, have him taken through to that level and achievement he's he's managed uh, is a very good uh, feeling. And I have the same with Michael now with a horse called Marakov. Uh, that I bought as a three-year-old in Latvia, uh, and he is now doing, you know, really good work with Michael in the Grand Prix. Uh, just came second in Wiedebahn in the in the queer freestyle uh, to music there, and um, you know that gives me a great a great satisfaction to see horses going through from the from the zero uh, as a three-year-old. They were just virtually broken uh, when when we got them, um, and then take them through to. Uh, to the level of um, Grand Prix and successful at that level is, is a you know is a is a great feeling because we have had uh, other horses, young horses that you have a lot of hopes for and you know it doesn't so easily turn out that way. Um, you know you can buy the the talent at the early age, but there's a lot there's a lot of um, training and uh, uh, communication to be done and uh, established on the way to the highest level. Well, we're going to continue this conversation with uh, Maria and Ferdy Alberg in just a second. When horsemen and women were asked what they were looking for in a nutritional supplement, the answer was easy. One that's affordable, effective and scientifically proven. Kentucky Performance Products took that message to heart and developed supplements that meet those needs. All of their supplements, from Nalox, Equine Antacid to Summer Games Electrolytes and Joy Tama, are formulated based on sound research. The important thing is that you can count on them to deliver results and they're affordable. So to choose the right KPP supplement for your horse, visit kppusa.com or call 1-800-772-1988. And to learn more about horse nutrition and interact with the KPP experts, be sure to visit their Facebook fan page. Well, I'm back with my guests this week, Maria and Ferdy Elberg. And Maria... Having so many good horses at a young age, some would say you you were spoiled. How could you not be as successful as you are? But as your dad says, it's a combination of talent as well. What was your feelings growing up about the horses that you were offered to ride, and and whether that you know whether you were maybe you had so much horsepower to choose from? Was that in any way intimidating at all? Um, well, I think actually the biggest thing is always to um, please my dad. That's the first thing which I <laughs> try and do. Um, so everything else comes after that. And if I manage to do that right, then everything falls into place. Um, but we're, we're really we're, we're not in a position to go out and buy horses which are probably made already. I mean that is becoming very very expensive. Um, so it's, it's keeping an eye out for the younger horses and then with um, the opportunity to train with my dad and my family, we can um, train them and bring them on. And, and we're very lucky to have the relationship with Woodland of Stud now, um, which, you know, very much into the breeding. And then we can help produce the horses alongside them. Yes, we've, we've had, uh, had some fantastic youngsters coming through from the Woodland of Stud. And uh, Michael just had uh, the five-year-old mayor that we have great hopes for uh, in the in the first international show in France, uh, coming out with the highest marks, you know, like 9.4, 9.8 for a general impression, and um, I think that you know that is just so exciting to uh, to have the chance of uh, having a horse at that age with that much talent, uh, and hopefully be able to bring it on to the you know to the highest level. That's um, you know sort of. As a as a horseman, you you actually live for that um, because that sort of talent is you know still these days it's still quite rare to to get that sort of absolutely top material. So tell us a little bit more about that, Ferdy, and when you would get these young horses. At what point do you actually start them, so to speak, and and produce them and and have them at home? Yes, what what we've uh, what we've done over the last sort of uh, two years, two and a half years is uh, you know to keep a keep a close relationship with the stud and I go quite often and have a look at the foals already uh, when they're born and then I uh, I see them a little bit on on different occasions as they develop and um, then we 
you know, we have uh, the, the opportunity to to look for the better talent from there and let them come along to the point where they become three, three and a half years old. They then come to our stable here and start their education. And uh, sometimes, you know, you need to filter still out a little bit because at that early age, it's not always that clear uh, what a horse is going to do. Uh, so, you know, this, this constant monitoring and, and readjusting yourself, we have that uh, great opportunity now to have the, the back, uh, back up from the breeding, uh, but, you know, have this unit here uh, where we work as the, you know, the education, uh, basically like the high school um, of, of education for the horses to then get the right basis and, and uh, get the opportunity that they have from their talent to, uh, to reach the higher levels. How many horses do you have at home at the time this time that are in work, Ferdy? Uh, well, I'd say we have we're quite sort of been for the last uh, three four months. We've been to uh, to maximum here really, and uh, we have uh, as I say up to twenty five boxes, and I'd say we have probably twenty twenty horses in work here. Now, when these horses come back to you, you start them at three and a half. At what point do you decide who's going to ride? With having so many jockeys to ride, who, who decides who gets to ride which horses? Well, we obviously try to sort of match the uh, the jockey to the to the to the horse a little bit. And um, in fact, Maria knows this. We, we quite often we swap we swap a little bit around between myself or Michael and Maria. Um, because we're obviously riding very much in the same in the same way, but uh, uh, I like to uh, sometimes, you know, I like this. Obviously, I see them a lot from the ground, but I like to have a feel on the horses' work here and there, so I get the the complete picture. And you know, you know, in the development of the young horses, uh, some sometimes they get a little bit boisterous and they get a little bit strong and they get a little bit sensitive, and so you know, we we have this great opportunity to. Uh, pass the sensitive ones more to Maria's way and pass the stronger ones to Michael's way and uh, me sort of coming in there in between, checking up on things. Uh, I think it works very well. So, Maria, in being brother and sister competing in this sport, I, I can imagine there's a certain competitiveness in the family. Do you feel that or do you just leave that at home and when you go out it's just between you and your horse? How does that play out either consciously or subconsciously? Well, I mean, it's obviously it's good to have a little bit of a competitive streak, and that's what makes you a good competitor. But um, I think we're just very um, much working together and wanting both of us to do really well, so very supportive of one another. Um, And it gives a real buzz if Mike does really well, if I do really well, and definitely if we both do really well. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Well, you did really well at the Alltech FEI World Equestrian Games last year, for which you won a silver medal. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Uh, that, I, I guess, if you put that in the context of your career so far, where does that sit? Oh, well, definitely high up. <laughs> definitely the highest achievement, I would say. I mean, I remember when I was 16 um, and having ridden Manitou at the uh, European Championships where we won the Team Silver we did a special parade at the Nationals and um, perfect opportunity to see all the senior riders. And I remember, you know, watching them in the Grand Prix thinking, you know, would you ever get to ride Grand Prix? And then I was thinking about it the other day to think back that you're actually on the team with senior riders who you've been watching as a 16-year-old, like Carl. You know, he was obviously competing then. Um, and then to have won a silver medal, um, it's, it's quite surreal, really. It doesn't sink in, I don't think. Um but yeah, no, I definitely have to keep that um, in my memory, and you know, you sort of so easily get used to going on to the next thing and forgetting about what you've done. No, it's definitely a great achievement. Well, we're going to take another short break, and when we come back, we're going to hear more about the horses' plans this season, and also what Michael will be riding. So don't go away; we'll be back in just a second. Equisketch is a great new company dedicated to providing the best mobile apps for every rider. Every app has been designed to be used by riders of all ages and all levels of experience. With Equisketch Dressage, you can replace your dressage paper or dry erase boards and begin learning all your dressage tests on your iPhone or iPad. The Equisketch board allows you to study in a flashcard style by hiding the step instructions while visualizing your location in the arena. 
Every test can also be viewed in a written format and later shared with your dressage students or fellow riders. Equisketch Records allows you to manage all your horses and shows on the go. Track every medication, vet visit, dental exam, farrier work and more, complete with built-in reminders. Equisketch has some of the best-selling equestrian apps on the iTunes App Store, which have already been purchased in over 35 countries. They're available for the iPhone, iPad and iPod Touch. Visit equisketch.com slash hrn for more information or search Equisketch in iTunes. Equisketch, dedicated to making your equestrian life mobile, one app at a time. Well, I'm back with my guests this week, Maria and Ferdy Alberg, and we've heard about the horses, the horsepower that you have, the horses that you have in the barn right now. Let's talk about the plans for this season, Ferdy, and what the schedule is for the horses that you're riding, and then we'll talk about Maria's and Michael's. Yes, I mean, I obviously sort of, I've stepped uh, for the last few years a little bit away from the competition myself, because I've had the... Uh, fortune for Michael and Maria to take that take that opportunity and and um, put ourselves out there. So um, you know my my function is mostly now to um, train a little bit with the horses at home and I ride quite a bit at home still. But uh, I don't think uh, there is any need for me to push myself too much into the competitive side uh, where the other two are doing so well. And uh, we've got you know constantly the the, the aim to bring on the younger, talented horses into the highest level of uh, of comp- competition. Uh, we've got um, two horses, again, from the Woodlander stud. Uh, Michael's riding a mare that is sort of in the process of making the jump between the small tour and the big tour. And the same for Maria's uh, rock star uh, stallion that is from the stud. He's in that same sort of level at the moment and you know, we we have to we have to look at two socks. Uh, he's now this year 17, and uh, he's done us very proud over the last six years in Grand Prix. He still feels very well, but uh, obviously the attention goes a little bit more to the younger ones now, and uh, trying to promote them to reach that same sort of level. Um, the, the next uh, the next level is the uh, five year olds, uh, six year olds, where we have a a lot of talent uh, in that um, uh, age, and um, it's always a little bit difficult to, you know, to make sure that the follow-through is always um, sustained because you know you get the, the, the chance to have a one or two horses uh, doing very well at the top level, but you you know as they're doing well, you have to already think about what's coming after and. You know, make sure that you promote the talent that sort of is the one that steps into that line. Well, Maria, your dad mentioned there, of course, two socks um, and uh, and Rockstar, two great horse partners for you. What what does your competition schedule look like this year? Um, well, we just we just returned from Vidaban, the show in France, so um, they had a two week competition out there. So we'll have a little short break now. Um, but we were looking to do Addington, which is an international over here. It's a great opportunity to compete at. Um, that will only be big tour, so that will be for two socks. And Mike will probably take one of his as well. Um, and then there are various internationals throughout the year. Um, I think it might be a very French year. There are quite a few French shows that look like they fitted in quite well. Um, and really, we, we need to try and go to the same shows because... We can't really afford to do too many different trips. Um, so I think uh, we'll, we'll just continue this year with going to internationals, which fit in. The horse is sort of doing two internationals at a time, um, works quite well, and then see what selection is like for later on in the season. Yes, it's always it's always a little bit the, the first part of the, the year with March and April, and when the outdoor outdoor season starts, you sort of really you have to look what the winter work has produced and you know what what uh, level the horses are at, especially when they come out to the international shows and you have to look a little bit then on the on the results and the possibilities of what you should be doing after that. It's it's very often difficult to plan your season right from the beginning to the end because you know the the, the way the horses are operating and you know the horses are coping. 
um, the results are coming in, you know, that all sort of directs you a little bit then in the middle of the of the season to where the where the preference or the importance lies. And, you know, the Europeans are coming up in Rotterdam. Um, that's obviously always an aim for us. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's a lot of competition in England now. Uh, a lot of good horses uh, are there, a lot of good riders are there. And the, the, the depth of, of talent uh, here now is, is uh, probably as high as it's, you know, never been before. So, you know, it obviously it raises the, raises the competitive uh, uh, approach. And, um, you know, you, you deal with horses that are living creatures and you need to make sure that they physically and mentally stay well so that they can compete at the highest level and, and, and the highest sort of output. Well, I've read somewhere, Maria, that you didn't like to go to a country where you couldn't speak the language. And since you're making several trips to France these days, how's your French doing? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, I did I did attempt to practice it this last time we went to France. It does need a little bit of brushing up, let's say. My German is probably better, I would think. Um, but I did, I did do um, my Open University languages um, when I was about 18. And I did the French up to A-level, but makes you realise how rusty you are when you actually have to use it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ferdy, you mentioned now the wealth of talent that you have in the country. Obviously, a very, very strong team and a lot of strong candidates for the team. I want to just ask you, since you've been based in England for so long and you've watched this growth of the sport in the UK, what do you put this down to obviously it must be a combination of factors but what would you say are the pivotal aspects of the growth and development of British dressage I think the um, you know the understanding see when I came to England at the end of 1980 the 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 dressage was quite weak uh, you know we had the 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 star of Jenny Lawrence and Clark and Dutch Courage um, uh, they obviously they were already uh, representing the country very well at the world stage, but the extra depth was very very weak in that uh, in those years. And you know we've had a few sort of bursts in in between where you know I can remember we always sort of looked at the beginning of the year and there were new talents uh, around, and then always still it didn't sort of seem to sustain. And when it came to championships and so on, then suddenly the the depth was quite sort of thin again. But um, I think they, they continuously, um, re, you know, reconfirming the standard abroad and, and making the effort, which, you know, let's face it, it's a considerable effort financially as well as, as time-wise to, to keep going out to the international shows. But, you know, by doing that, you consistently keep yourself in line with the, with the overall standard. And, of course, Europe is, uh, is quite high in the... In the, in the in the bigger shows there, you know, like Aachen and um, and a few of the the bigger German shows or Rotterdam, you know, it, it presents a very high standard of um, of sport there and relating to that constantly and trying to achieve to get closer to it has brought the the, the dressage in in Britain up tremendously and of course one has to mention the the the, the horses because without talented horses. The best riding in the world couldn't succeed, but um, you know I think the combination of the horses have got better, the riding has got better, and the adjusting to the international level of the sport uh, has produced where we are now. Do you think there's been a growth in the interest in young people where they have so many choices of which discipline to go into, Ferdy? And in, historically, it, eventing was very, very popular, but dressage now has gained its own momentum and it is attracting young people to specialise at an early age. Yes, I've, I've always, you know, when I first came over, there was the, the, the younger people, they were all eventing and they were all sort of saying to me quite openly, I can't do dressage now. I'm healthy. My horse is healthy. I have to, <laughs> I have to go venting. Um, you know, once once my horse has got a bad leg and I've got a bad back, then I might <laughs> do the dressage. So uh, that that was a little bit the the attitude then. But it, I think the the understanding. I've seen it as well because I've been very closely involved with the eventing and seeing the dressage develop in the eventing side. Um, you know, the understanding of actually that the 
the the um, proper flat work, uh, making the horse use itself, making the horse come on the eighth properly and have the have the right sort of development physically uh, coming on. This is something that works for any discipline. You can you can apply this to an eventer. You can apply this to a short jumper. You can apply this to a dressage horse. And I think this this understanding has has brought the dressage into the into the loop of the other disciplines because it's sort of at the early stage it was sort of sitting out there a little bit you know like a, a type of circus rather than you know being to do with the riding and the horses and so on. But I think that is what's changed uh, dramatically is that you know that making the horse work well with whatever discipline you point him to after that, that is the foundation for everything. Well, I want to remind you about one of our sponsors here on the show. And when we come back, I'm going to ask Maria a little bit more about this subject. If you've been digging out your show clothes in readiness for the season and found some of them need replacing, there's an easy solution to that problem with a visit to equestriancollections.com. They have the latest in spring and show clothes for you, your spouse and your children at prices you can afford. Not only do they have a great selection, great prices and a state-of-the-art website, that is what you get for looking at equestriancollections.com. So be sure to visit them for all your showing needs at equestriancollections.com. Well, I'm back now with my guests, uh, Maria and Ferdy Alberg. Maria, your dad talked then about the growth of British dressage, and I want to ask you finally uh, your thoughts about the growth. In As far as a young person is concerned, it has become very competitive to get on the team. Now, the standard has been raised. That has to be good for the sport and obviously for British dressage to have that much choice. How do you feel about the growth of, of British dressage and and, you know, compare it to the other sports that you too could have a go at. You did do eventing, and now you're concentrating on dressage very successfully. Yes, I mean, I, I think it's fantastic. I mean, as Dad said earlier, people um, did sort of have the opinion that dressage was rather boring and not much going on. But I think um, I think with it being publicized a lot more now, I mean, there was a lot more coverage um, already with Windsor, the Europeans in 2009, and Kentucky last year, Um and then having the superstars that we had, the Totalus and Laura's, ho- Laura's horse, Mr. Horace, um, I mean, I think that they're, they're such super horses, they really stun people with their capability. Um, and I think also the um, freestyle to music has really improved publicity. I mean, it's become a lot more exciting now, and it is a lot for the horses to take in when they have to go, especially sort of when they do the gala evenings when it's under floodlight and it's dark and lights everywhere, the music's very loud, jazzy, lots of people. Um, but, you know, they can get used to it. We're doing it regularly enough, and it definitely draws the crowds in. Well, it certainly does. Your dad mentioned, of course, uh, that he's also involved in eventing. And for those of you who follow the shows here on the Horse Radio Network will know that the uh, I host the eventing radio show. And on this week's show, we have one of Ferdy's protégé, and that is Mary King and her daughter, Emily King. And uh, looking forward to that conversation, too, as well. So take a listen to eventingradio.com this week. A little bit of cross-promotion doesn't do any harm between the sports, does it, Ferdy? Not at all, not at all. <laughs> well, before you go, I want to ask you about that really frightening where you had a couple of things that just didn't go your way last year. Um, first of all, you had an accident, Maria, and then your dad had an accident at, at home, and I know that was a pretty terrifying moment. It, just talk us through that and how you both are now, presumably fully fit. Yeah, well, I, I actually I had a flashback of that just as we started the conversation thinking that... Um, if Dad hadn't have come through that, he wouldn't be here doing the conversation with me. Um, it, that that was pretty horrific. My accident really wasn't anything compared to that. I was being a bit stupid and going too fast on a bike at a show and went and bust my elbow. Um, but it was very, very lucky that that didn't um, ruin the season for me. And then uh, it was shortly after that when we got back home that um, Dad had actually been riding um, two socks a little bit for me and the other horses because I was unable to ride. And uh, he was on the outdoor arena. And I think at the time, Michael, my brother, was out there. Um, and I was inside putting a bridle on another horse about to come out. And I suddenly heard Michael scream, well, yell at the top of his voice, which I've never heard him do before. And I thought, what the hell has happened? Um, ran outside and, and Dad was lying on the floor with blood all around his head. And, of course, the first thing you think is, 
that, you know, the worst has happened. Um, he wasn't moving, nothing, and, and Michael was extremely distressed. I haven't ever seen him that distressed. My, my other brother, Luke, was there as well, and he'd just gone totally silent and shock. Um, and we've, we've all done our first aid, but, um, you know, you've done it, and you just go completely static. You don't do anything. Um, my mum actually was the saviour. She came running out, was extremely cool-headed, and managed to, you know, go through the whole procedure. Um, we called the ambulance. The helicopter came. Um, but, it, it, I mean, it was... It was extremely tricky because Dad, Dad had sort of landed quite close to the entrance of the arena. And so, of course, with the helicopters coming over, all the horses were in the arena and we couldn't get them out. So they, they all started to go a little bit spare. So we had to radio the helicopters to go away again and get an ambulance to come on the ground. And, uh, yeah, we, we were all a little, little distressed. Yeah. <laughs> Needless to say, I don't remember any of this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I just sort of afterwards I thought I, you know, for 40 years I've been working so many tricky horses and working them in hand and always saw them coming. And yet this one I suddenly didn't see coming, uh, which was, you know, very unfortunate on one side. But I have to say I consider myself very lucky that uh, the way it's turned out. And, um, you know, obviously you you need that uh, a little bit um, here and there that it uh, it turns out the right way. It was, it was actually, you, you had the horse go through your cheek with its foot, didn't you? Yes, it, it was quite extraordinary that I, I got landed with both hind feet with the shoes on, and I had one foot hitting me on the upper arm and the other foot hitting me in the face and um, made a hole in my cheek, and yet I had no bone broken whatsoever. Oh. You know, not, not my nose, not my cheek, not my arm, nothing was broken, and yet uh, I took quite a took quite a blow, so uh, maybe somebody was looking after me there. Well, that's extraordinary, and what a relief uh, from what was obviously a very scary time for all of you. And we should put this in context, Ferdy. You are, I believe, in now the mid, we'd have to say late 50s, just. Yes, I'm afraid. <laughs> I sort of keep forgetting my age, but uh, it is 58. And uh, is it, I think with the sport of dressage, it's something we can continue to do, God willing, that it's not. It's not like you're jumping and going galloping cross country. It, you don't look at any retirement any time sooner. You expect him to just keep going as long as you can. Yes, absolutely. I, you know, I, you know, I mean, everybody probably says that that you know you don't really feel that much older, but uh, you know maybe the reflexes get a little bit less. But uh, you know, I, um, I still enjoy very much to be physically involved, and I've always uh, felt that my my back actually stays a hell of a lot better when I keep riding than when I'm not riding. That's a blessing, of course. So how about you, Maria? Are you, do you do anything else to keep fit, or are you just focus on your riding as your as your means of fitness? Yes, I mean, um, in the winter when you don't have the longer days, I try and do a little bit more, um, sort of with the not with the gym particularly, but just going for a run and doing um, some strength and conditioning work. Uh, but I have to say my time is pretty much taken up with running around the place and, and riding, and I find that that keeps me pretty fit. Um, I do think that the strength and conditioning is important, so trying to fit that in to build just core strength. And I always do sort of a few stretches here and there each day to try and um, stretch my muscles out. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite a physical physical profession, so I don't have to do much else. Well, physical and very focused, and clearly your big goal this year must be the European Championships in Rotterdam. So we want to wish you the very best of luck with that goal and to both of you for all your endeavours in sport and for your contributions, of course, not just to the team, but for anything associated with horses. I know you've been recognised, Ferdy, by the British Horse Society for your services. And, of course, a lot more to come, we hope, with both of you. Uh, the very best of luck to you all and uh, good luck with the season. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. All right. I want to remind you all that you can follow our show notes at dressageradio.com. You can also contact me at chris at horseradionetwork.com if you have any questions or comments. I will ha- be back, of course, same time, same place next week. So until then, thank you all for listening. 